All right. So for the last part for this first exam, histology. So histology. So what is histology? Histology is the study of tissue. What's a tissue? A tissue, a group of cells and the stuff they made come from the same part of the embryo working together to do something in an organ. There are four primary classes of tissues. There are epithelial tissues, connective tissues, neural and muscular tissues. These, these are your four primary tissue classes. Oh, well, this thing hates me right now. Hold on. Anyway, so here's our hierarchy of structure, atoms, molecules, cells, right, and our four primary tissue classes. Outside the cells, we have the cell matrix or the extracellular matrix, proteins and some stuff. Sometimes it's called, uh, this stuff is like fluid, interstitial fluid. Extracellular fluid, ground substance. There's water and minerals and stuff. The first type of tissue that we'll talk about is called epithelial tissue. Now, epithelial tissue is just cells, sheets of cells. And the outside surface of these sheets of cells will either be exposed to a hollow cavity inside you or to the external environment. Epithelial tissue covers the body. Your skin is epithelial tissue. It lines the organs and the body cavities and makes up lots of glandular tissue. And all epithelial tissue has five characteristics. The first of those is polarity, meaning there's two sides. There's a basal surface that sits on what's called the basement membrane. And there's an apical surface that faces the open space or the outside world. So the basal surface is down here at the bottom. And the apical surface is up here facing the open space or the outside. Epithelial cells form sheets. So they are held together by tight junctions and desmosome. Connects them together to form these sheets. Epithelial tissue is always supported by connective tissue. There's always connective tissue under it. In that basement membrane, we've got collagen and these adhesive proteins. The job is to anchor this to the tissue that's under, the connective tissue that's under. Epithelial tissue is avascular. Avascular means it does not have blood vessels going through it. As I mentioned, your skin, or at least the outer layer of your skin, is made up of epithelial tissue. Epithelial tissue is avascular. You've done this, right? You've cut yourself, but it doesn't bleed. You didn't go all the way through. Like the stupid paper cut, right? You've had those, those paper cuts that don't bleed. Still hurts like hell, doesn't bleed. So it's avascular, but it's innervated. Innervated means that it has a nerve supply. There are neurons that go there. You have sensory neurons going, in this case, to the skin. It's innervated, but there aren't blood vessels going through it. The blood vessels are in deeper tissue. So epithelial tissue, avascular, but innervated. Epithelial tissue also regenerates because part of it is exposed to the outside world. It dies off. I mean, there's a lot of wear and tear going on here and new cells are continually replacing old cells. It regenerates. If it's damaged, it will grow back. There are two main types of epithelial tissue, simple epithelium and stratified epithelium. Simple epithelium 
is one layer of cells so that every cell touches the basement membrane. Stratified epithelium cells are sitting on top of each other. You have multiple layers of cells. So here at the top, you see simple epithelium, right? One layer of cells. And down at the bottom, you see stratified epithelium. Cells are sitting on top of other cells. There are also different shapes of cells that you see in that particular picture. Squamous cells are thin and flat, like fish scales. Cuboidal cells are, you know, cuboidal. And columnar cells are like columns. Pseudostratified means fake stratified. It looks like it's stratified, but it's really not. There's still just one layer of cells there. It's just that the tall cells are sitting on top of the short cells. Each of these has sort of a different function. Simple squamous, thin, flat cells, one layer of thin, flat cells. This is not much of a barrier. So you find this in places where you need something to move across that layer really fast. The lining of the blood vessels, so when you get down to the capillary stuff can move in and out of the bloodstream really fast. Uh, the alveoli in the lungs, so the oxygen and carbon dioxide, don't have much of a barrier to cross to get in and out of the blood. And so simple squamous epithelium, where you need to move something across really fast. So here you see that simple squamous epithelium, these thin, flat cells. Simple columnar epithelium, still associated with absorption and secretion. Remember, it's just one layer of cells. Most of these will have like microvilli and cilia or something you see here. So here you see microvilli in the small intestine. But you need to associate simple epithelium with absorption or secretion, mostly absorption. And you definitely need to be able to associate microvilli with absorption. Microvilli increase the surface area of a cell. So for cells specialized for absorption, you're going to see microvilli here in the small intestine, increasing the surface area. Pseudostratified, still associated with absorption and secretion. Tall cells overlap shorter cells. Here we see that ciliated cells in the, in the trachea. These will be associated with the secretion of mucus there in the trachea. And, and what you have here is the, the big cells are leaning over on top of the short cells. Simple columnar and pseudostratified columnar are often associated with goblet cells or mucus cells through here. Goblet cells are little glands that secrete mucus on the surface of the cells, and those little cilia will move and move that mucus. Simple cuboidal epithelium we find in the kidney tubules. Again, moving the product across. Simple epithelium, always moving something across that barrier because it's one cell thick. There's simple cuboidal epithelium. Stratified epithelium, anything more than one layer. And while we do see all three types of stratified epithelium, really only one of them we see a lot of, and that's stratified squamous epithelium. Stratified squamous epithelium is the most abundant epithelial tissue, period. There's more of it than there is of anything else. There are two types of stratified squamous epithelium, keratinized and non-keratinized. Keratinized, the outer layer of your skin. It's covered with a layer of dead skin cells. Non-keratinized, like the lining of your mouth. It's always kept wet, so there to resist abrasion, but layers and layers of cells. So here you see the stratified squamous epithelium of the mouth. This is non-keratinized, and so there's no dead cells, they're all alive. So when you um, get that little test tube and the cotton swab in the mail for you to swab the inside of your mouth, you can send it back, not the father, then that's what you're doing is you're scraping away these squamous cells. Here is keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. See all these dead cells on the surface of the skin. Stratified columnar, 
the stratophycuboidal epithelium are not very common. They're super rare. You find them in some of the larger ducts of glands, maybe in salivary glands or sweat glands. Here's simple cubo or sorry, stratified cuboidal epithelium in a sweat gland duct. Um, here's stratified colonial epithelium in a salivary gland duct. It's never going to be more than like three layers thick. Transitional epithelium, you find in the bladder. I suppose in the umbilical cord too, but really the bladder. The shape vary, varies on the extension of the bladder. As the bladder fills, it stretches the cells out. So here you see this transitional epithelium in an empty bladder, and they look kind of cuboidal. When the bladder fills up, they stretch out and they look more columnar. So this, this is simple cuboidal epithelium. Here is simple columnar epithelium. Those are goblet cells. Here is a really poor picture of a simple squamous epithelium. Here's pseudostratified columnar epithelium. How do I know it's pseudostratified? Multiple clues. The cilia. You'll never see true stratified epithelium with cilia or microvilli. Because stratified epithelium there is there for protection. You're not going to see either one of these. Goblet cells. Goblet cells are always going to be associated with simple columnar or pseudostratified columnar epithelium. So even though I can't see that that cell touches the basement membrane, it does. Stratified squamous epithelium, and it's keratinized, it's all dead. Non keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. Here's stratified cuboidal. And finally, transitional epithelium there in the umbilical cord. Glandular epithelium is epithelial tissue that makes a gland, and a gland is a group of cells that's secreting a product. We have both endocrine and exocrine glands. We're not going to talk about endocrine glands right now. They make hormones. That's a topic for another semester. Exocrine glands secrete the product either onto the skin or into this open cavity. So mucus and bile and sweat, that sort of thing. There are two types of exocrine glands, unicellular and multicellular. The unicellular exocrine gland, think a mucus cell or a goblet cell. Multicellular exocrine glands are classified by their secretion mode, sometimes by their structure. Most multicellular exocrine glands are merocrine glands, which means they release their product through exocytosis. On a little vesicle, wrap it up, throw it out. Some of them are holocrine glands. Holocrine glands make a product, don't form a vesicle, don't throw it out, wait until that product builds up and then explode. Hey, it's something. So there are some of those. And the third type of multicellular exocrine gland, it's called an apocrine gland, their presence in people is debatable. In an apocrine gland, the product builds up in like a chunk of the cell and a chunk of the cell breaks off. We can also classify them based on their structure. So here you see the different sorts of structures of glandular tissue. Here's a merocrine gland, right? Exocytosis. There's an apocrine gland where that little chunk of the cell is breaking off. And then here's the holocrine gland where the whole cell is exploding. So those are all epithelial tissues. And again, epithelial tissues, just cells, sheets of cells. Connective tissues, different story. Connective tissues, mostly other crap. Right, they're cells, but they made a lot of stuff. So it's mostly that extracellular material. The cells are separated out pretty far and there's a lot of stuff. Connective tissue is the most abundant, the most variable tissue. There are four connective tissue types, bone, cartilage, blood, and connective tissue proper. So what does connective tissue do? Well, Whatever bone, cartilage, blood, and connective tissue proper does, right? It connects things. It holds stuff together. It's your immune system. It's moving around oxygen and carbon dioxide. It's storing minerals. It's support. It's moving. All right, there's lots of stuff. 
Connective tissue proper is what we'll focus on now because we got to come back to bone and cartilage and blood later. The cells of connective tissue proper are called fibroblasts. Now that suffix there, that blast, that is a cell that's secreting the extracellular matrix. So fibroblasts, for our purposes, are making more connective tissue proper. Macrophages and leukocytes and plasma cells and mast cells are all part of your immune system and that's often associated with some of these connective tissues. Adipocytes are fat cells. Now there are different types of protein fibers. There's collagen fibers. Some organs will find reticular fibers and some tissues will find elastic fibers. It's a sort of gel that's made up of these protein carbohydrate blends that we see over here. So let's talk about the different types of connective tissue proper. The two major types are loose connective tissue and dense connective tissue proper. There are three types of loose connective tissue proper. Areolar tissue, the fibers are just random. There's some cells you see. It's kind of stretchy. It's got some elastic fibers. Lots of space. And here you see it between the different like binding stuff together. Here's reticular tissue, this mesh that's formed. Now in this mesh, this is the spleen incidentally. Got this mesh, it's kind of squishy. All these little white blood cells are leukocytes there. Adipose tissue is fat tissue. So the cells are adipocytes. Dense connective tissue is different. Dense connective tissue, most of the space is taken up by fibers. And there are two types of dense connective tissue. Dense regular connective tissue, the fibers run parallel to each other. There's not a lot of room for blood vessels here. This is what tendons and ligaments are made out of. Dense irregular connective tissue, still mostly fibers, but they're in random directions. So here we have the, the tissue that's holding the skin to the muscle that's underneath. Or at least the holding the uh, outer layers there. So those are all types of connective tissue proper. Remember, there are four types of connective tissue. Connective tissue proper, bone, cartilage, and blood. Here's cartilage, more on that later. Here's bone, more on that later. And here's blood. Blood is a liquid, it's the only liquid tissue, but it is connective tissue. Remember your qualifications for connective tissue, cells and extracellular matrix. The cells here, you see, the extracellular matrix is on here. Just here, the extracellular matrix is a liquid. Finally, we have our last two tissue types, neural tissue and muscle tissue. They're both excitable. We're not going to talk about it right now. Right now, all you need to know about neural tissue and muscular tissue is that those are two of the four primary tissue classes. Tissue will be repaired either through regeneration or fibrosis. Regeneration, the cells grow back. How epithelial tissue heals. Fibrosis is the formation of scar tissue. Often how connective tissue heals. So you see this fibrosis that occurs through here. And then it's rebuilt over time. Histopathology was examining tissue to study diseases. I've seen lots of students over the years and often I've got students that really want to be involved in the medical field but don't deal well with people, don't enjoy the presence of people. There is still a job for you and it's an important one and that's in pathology. This, the people in the lab are the unsung heroes of all of this. Right, when you get a biopsy done, your doctor doesn't go back and figure out that you have cancer. He sends it off to the lab 
And the lab sends him back a diagnosis that says, yeah, that's cancer. And the doctor comes in and says, it's cancer. And you're like, oh, no. Or the doctor comes in and he's like, guess what? It's not cancer. And you're like, oh, thank you so much. He didn't do anything. He sent it off in the mail. Stuck the stamp on it or whatever. The dude in the lab figured it out. Right? You watch CSI and the, the guy's like, well, here's the cause of death. No. The histopathology people determine this. It's in the back, and then they look at the tissues under a microscope, and they're looking at the microscopic damage that's in the tissue. Now, to do this, of course, you have to remove the tissue. So surgery or biopsy or autopsy, and then you have to preserve it. It's called fixing a tissue. And then we stain it. Realize that all those slides we looked at are stained, right? Tissues aren't really pink and purple. We stain them so that we can see the cells. So there's some terms that we're going to use throughout the semester. And you do need to be familiar with these terms because, like I said, we, we use them sort of in our vocabulary. The first of these is atrophy. Atrophy is the shrinkage of a tissue, either because the cells themselves are getting smaller or because they're dying off. Here we see muscle atrophy. Muscular atrophy, bone atrophy, atrophy of the facial muscles there. Any tissue can atrophy. The rule of atrophy is if you don't use it, you lose it. Don't use the muscles, they atrophy. Don't use the bones, they atrophy. Don't feed the muscles or the bones, they atrophy. If you don't use it, you lose it any tissue and in alzheimer's disease we see atrophy of the brain then chronic users of anabolic steroids we see testicular atrophy any tissue can atrophy necrosis is the premature death of tissue lots of things cause necrosis toxins trauma, blocking circulation. More often than not, however, it is infection. When you look at this necrotic wound, that tissue is dead and dying. Dead tissue, like so, is toxic to living tissue. So this needs to be removed so that one, the living tissue can grow back into that space. Right now, that real estate's been taken up by death, and to stop it from spreading any further. Here is necrosis of tissue. Any tissue can become necrotic. Right, so here you see necrosis of not just the skin, but the muscle and the bone as well. Incidentally. Uh, our first picture on that page, the picture before was caused by um, some sort of bacterial infection. Here we see uh, necrosis caused by lack of circulation um, after a snake bite from a snake called the fer de lens. It's an extremely venomous South American snake, typically fatal bites. They saved this dude by tying a tourniquet around his leg up here. Unfortunately, that cut off circulation to his leg and it killed the leg. Here you see necrosis post snake bite, both of these, courtesy rattlesnakebite.org, which is a thing. So post bite, you see the necrosis there. Here you see the instant necrosis from the bite in the center of the palm. Now this, from this down here, that is not necrosis. That is done intentionally. That is called a fasciotomy, in which the uh, physician takes a scalpel and makes an incision through the skin into the underlying fascia. Because as inflammation happens out here in the extremity, it's going to swell up and eventually that skin sort of becomes a tourniquet and it cuts off circulation to the, the limb. Do the fasciotomy so that the 
the skin and the underlying tissues can swell out of the bounds of the skin. Incidentally, I'll note to you that both of those rattlesnake bites are on a hand. Every rattlesnake, and, and this is not, I've heard of other rattlesnake bites. I've seen people get bitten on the leg. You know, a guy got bitten in the butt, he sat on one. Um, but in a clinical setting, the three or four rattlesnake bites that I saw were coming in post-surgery from the fasciotomy. Took stitches removed, and they were both on the hand. Don't pick up rattlesnakes. You're welcome. Here's necrosis. This is gangrene. Necrosis of all these tissues. This is typical sort of diabetic necrosis. You can see the spread of that necrotic tissue all the way down the foot. And they'll lose their foot. Um, here is uh, what we think of as like a flesh-eating bacterial infection. Here's an infarction. Now, in an infarction, tissue dies suddenly due to lack of oxygen or circulation. Cerebral infarction due to the skull injury. This is a myocardial infarction or a heart attack. Actually, this is multiple infarcts. So we have an old heart attack here, and you can see right there that white, that's scar tissue where the heart attack happened, it damaged the heart muscle, and it had time to rebuild scar tissue there. Now, scar tissue is not heart muscle. It sucks. Here you have the fresher infarct, the one that apparently killed the guy. Spoiler alert, he's dead. We're looking at a slice of his heart. And you can see that necrotic tissue there that happens. This is actually a testicular infarction. And that white stripe of scar tissue there happened. Testicular infarctions are asymptomatic. You don't know about them until somebody's dissecting your cadaver for med school. You're like, look, there's a testicular infarction. Let's put a picture on the internet so that someone can use it in the slideshow. Here's this necrotic tissue from a myocardial infarction. You see like these little cell cellular debris and junk out here. Cells that divide uncontrollably. Tumors, neoplasms, and cancer, uncontrollably dividing cells. These tumors are classified as benign or malignant. Malignant tumors are like they're growing and moving. Metastasis is the term we have for the movement of these uh, cancer cells. What causes cancer? And if, if I knew that, if I had like a definitive, hey, that's what causes cancer, we wouldn't be sitting here talking. Right, I'd be curing cancer from my beach house or whatever. The thing with cancer is they're your cells, man. They're just screwed up. So genetics are a lot of this, and everybody's different. There's some frustration in cancer patients that I've known where they see another patient who has the same type of cancer they do, that's getting a different treatment because treatments have to be tailored to the patient because everybody's cancer is unique because everybody's cancer is their own physiology turning against them. They're your cells that are replicating uncontrollably. And there is some genetics. There are genes, we call them proto-oncogenes. And they, if they're damaged, they cause this uncontrolled replication. Now, if they're not damaged, you're cool. No, you're never going to know this. An oncogene is a tumor gene. And that happens when these proto-oncogenes get damaged by a chemical or uh, energy, something that causes it, a carcinogen, something that causes this formation of tumors. Think smoking or candy beds or whatever. Luckily, we've got a built-in failsafe system. Tumor suppressor genes. Tumor suppressor genes, when cells go awry, they cause self-destruction of that cell. Around half of cancer involves malfunction of two of those tumor suppressor genes. Here's a, a graphic from this article I was reading. Uh, it shows sort of an example of how these tumor suppressor genes work up here. Here you have the P53 tumor suppressor. And in a normal P53 cell, if you damage the DNA, that P53 causes the cell to die. So now there's no cancer. 
right? It, it would have been cancer, but self-destructed. If that P53 gene is not working, well, then when that DNA is damaged, uh, you got cancer. There's nothing to stop it. You can ignore this viral vector thing. That's what the article is about. But this graphic up here is how that tumor suppressor thing works. Around half of us get cancer. Around 20% of us die of cancer. Treatments for cancer, depending on the cancer, may involve surgically removing the tumor, radiation to kill the cancer cells, or chemotherapy to kill the cancer cells. These are not pleasant treatments. And there are lots of side effects to this. What should happen is those cells should die. Programmed cellular death is apoptosis. This is not to be confused with necrosis. Apoptosis is supposed to happen. The cells are old, the cells are worthless, the cells die, and they are replaced, or they're not. Apoptosis. But development apoptosis is essential, right? In utero, um, during part of your development, you've got webbed fingers, the webbing in between the fingers. That tissue, the cells of that tissue undergo apoptosis, programmed cellular death. They're supposed to die. All right. So that brings us to a stop here for histology. Your first exam is up to this point. Your first lab exam, the skull bones, which is also posted on your YouTube channel. Study that and we'll get your first exam posted um, soon. I don't remember the date exactly, but we'll get that posted soon and uh, move from there.